Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Welcome, y'all. Welcome to Theology on Thursday. Come on and get in. Get in, get in. Come on, come on in, y'all. Say something nice when y'all get in here, too. Amen. <laughs> so, um, I hope y'all got y'all snacks. I got mine. This is pretzels, dips, and Hershey's chocolate. These are good with some popcorn, by the way. Come on in. Come on in, y'all. Hey, Essence, I love you. Come on in the room. I think the Audrey on Thursday needs, like, a theme song. Like, welcome to the allergy on Thursday. On Thursday. I don't know. We'll think about it. We'll have one next week. Amen. Come on. Come on in. Hey, Mom, I love you. My mom's on here. <laughs> come on in, y'all. Come on in. Come on in. All right. So we're going to get started. I'm going to pray real quick. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for another day to dive into your word. Thank you for what your word has. Father, thank you for the revelation that is coming through your word. Father, I pray that as, that as, rele that as I release this word to your people, that it pierces the hearts of your people, that they may change their lives for the better. Father, thank you for the healing that is going to come forth through this word. Thank you for the, the deliverance that is going to come forth through this word. Father, thank you that people are already running to Christ with this word. In your great name, I pray. Amen. Come on, y'all. So, um, welcome to Theology on Thursdays again. I'm in. I'm Isaiah Holmes. I'm one of the worship leaders here at DGC. Um, y'all might see me, you know, on um, worship encounters every second, fourth Friday, screaming and hollering and stuff, singing. That's me. Um, but yep, I'm not singing and hollering today. Maybe I might get there. Might not. We'll see. But um, yeah, let's get started. So, um, my assignment is to kind of teach on worship and what worship is and how do we do worship and um it was first of all i want to thank um god for my apostles apostle Dwayne and apostle cheryl for trusting me with this assignment um i don't take it lightly um actually you know i was a little nervous to come on here but hey we're here but um all right so let's get started so um i want to just um start off with maybe like a um like a little demonstration just so I can make my case, build my build my case a little bit. So just stick with me and use your imagination because I'm going to have y'all do that a lot. All right. So as you can see, um, I have a blue card. Sorry, a red card and a blue card. Um, there's only one red card, but there's tons of blue cards here. And each blue card has its own value. Um, it holds value. And so does the red card. But as, as you can see, it's only a few blue cards, but only one red card. So, so keep that in mind as well. Um, so on the back of this one, this says peace. This is on this is the value that this card holds. It holds peace. And on this red card holds life. And so I'm using this demonstration because um, I have a whole bunch of cards here, and each card of the blue cards has holds a different value. So we have peace. We have happiness, we have money, and we have love. And um, this game is um, the more cards that you collect, the more blue cards that you collect, the more value you hold. But I want to throw just a little bit of a twist to this game. So as you can see, I'm plucking from my deck of blue cards, and I get love. But then I keep plucking and I come to a blue card that has nothing on it. It's black. That means all of the cards that I have collected, I have to give one away. So that might that hurts me because it feels like I've lost some of my value that I already collected. So I'm going back through this deck of cards trying to collect that same value that I lost. Now with this, I don't have to do any more plucking. This card is life. This card holds value. This card is life. And I don't need to keep plucking from the blue stack of cards because I have this one card that is that equals the amount of all the blue cards combined. Um, so today, I just want to take a journey. That's, this is my demonstration. I just wanted to build my case just a little bit just so y'all understand. 
So um, let's journey through the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. I'm just going to um, kind of paraphrase, but not really, of the story. So um, in John 4, the story centers around Jesus and his encounter with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Jesus asked the woman for a drink of water, which in initiates a dialogue between them. Despite the cultural and religious barriers between Jews and the Samaritans, Jesus engages her in a conversation, revealing his identity as the Messiah. During their exchange, Jesus reveals details about the woman's life, including her multiple marriages and her current relationship status. This surprises her and leads her to recognize Jesus as the prophet, like he's that man. Um, their conversation evolves into a discussion about worship during which Jesus emphasizes the important importance of worshiping in the spirit and truth rather than focusing solely on physical locations or rituals. So that was just, just like a little like summary of, of John 4. I can read it later. But I want to focus on John chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. And it reads, Jesus, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritan worship, you Samaritan, sorry, worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the father seeks. God is a spirit and he and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So with that being said, I want you all to think about things in your life that you really depend on, things that you really can't let up, things that hold so much value in your life that you really don't want to let go of, that you'll go to war for yours, you know? Um, so that's like Jacob's well. Like some, uh, the Samaritan woman, she kind of went to war over, Jake, over this well because she thought that it was being attacked or she thought that it was trying to be replaced of something different. But, I mean, so those things that you're holding dear, are they really fulfilling to you? Are, are, are they truly fulfilling to you? Or do, or do they leave you wanting more? Jesus is requiring a certain heart posture of his people, a heart posture of worship, a worship that is pure and worship that is unconditional. But what is worship, y'all? If y'all want to let me know, uh, I mean, I can tell y'all. I got it right here, but I just want to ask y'all a question. But hey. um, worship is defined as giving honor, homage, reverence, respect, adoration, praise, or glory to a superior being. So that's honor, homage, reverence, respect, adoration, praise, and glory to a superior being. But who is really this superior being, though? Um, like, who are we giving all this praise, all this honor, respect to? It's to God. It's to God, the Father, the God, God the Creator. And um, if I was talking to a new believer and the question was asked, why are we required to worship? I would tell them because he simply just deserves it. He created heaven and earth. He is sovereign. He is Lord. And without him, we'll all be nothing. Um, Revelation 4 and 11 um, says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So it is our duty. It's, it's our responsibility. It is our destiny up in this world to worship the God who, who created us. Now, um, I just want to, before I get into the, the meat of the message, I just want to discuss the aspects of the worship, of worship. And, um, I learned this shameless plug. I learned this by reading the Ascend book by Dr. Dwayne Whitehead. It's a really good book. Y'all, y'all really need to watch and um, read it. It's like, it's, it's key to worship. It's, it's, if you know, don't know what worship is by the end of this, at least go read the book because the book will tell you too. So, um, so, um, he was talking about, um, three aspects of worship which is sacrifice, submission, and service. So um, a few of my points will be coming from those aspects, those, those three aspects. Um, first one being submission. So um, the Samaritan woman went back and forth with Jesus. She was certain that the Jacob's well was exactly enough because it, ga it gave her what she thought she needed, like what she thought she needed. And um, for a second, I want you all just to close your eyes and just like, Imagine that use your imagination um, and just 
I'm, I'm getting ready to explain how the woman described the well, Jacob's well, because this is how I think she described it. So, y'all, imagine this well. The well was built to perfection, y'all. Like, there was no flaw in this well. The stones were placed at the right spot. It was very durable, and it was not likely to be destroyed. Um, I'm sure it had a ledge somehow to sit down at the church. You go to the well, have a little chit-chat before you go home and dinner, chicken, stew, rice, all that soup. Yeah, they sat down just to have like a quick conversation. I've, that's what I'm picturing at the ledge, like conversation at the well, you know. So um, I'm sure it had somewhere to sit down. The well was so deep that you really couldn't look down and actually see the water. It was like a black hole. Like it was just dark. Like You couldn't see. You don't know what was down there. Um, it was so dark, you couldn't even tell that there was water at the bottom. That's how I'm imagining. Um, although that there was um, the water, it was so black in the well, but there was always water at the bottom waiting for whoever needed it at the time. The water for Jacob's well was easy to access. You were able to get some water quickly without working so hard. It's just like a straight trip up and down. You put the bucket down and you come back up with some water. You didn't have to give the well anything in return to get the water. It was free. All you needed was a bucket to hold that water. So also, I want you to close your eyes again and imagine how the woman was listening to Jesus explain what his well looked like. So she physically didn't see the well, the, the stones that he was talking about. It was only Jesus telling her about this well. So she probably assumed that the well was very small. It didn't have a lot of water because if I can't see it, what kind of water is in there? Like, like what's been, like, what's the benefits for me? You know? And, um, she probably pictured this miniature well, small enough to fit in, some, small enough to fit in someone's pocket. Cause again, she couldn't see it. So she had nothing to compare it to. Um, and I was thinking like, it's hard. I, I understand her pushback with Jesus when he was telling my well was better because it's hard to really agree to something when you really can't see what you're getting yourself into. Um, but little did she know the well that Jesus has gives life. It gives life. And this well was so fulfilling that you wouldn't have to keep going back to this stack or to another well to get the satisfaction that you need because all the satisfaction that you need is with Jesus and he gives life. Now, um, I have to give it to her, though. She did make a good claim about this well. This well sounds like it's the, one, it's the way to go. Like, her sales pitch was top tier. If she was selling me something, I'd buy it quick. But what I noticed was um, the well was so dark that you couldn't see. Um, it could have been anything at the, down at the well. So it could have been blood that she bought up from the well. It could have been poison. It could have been mud. So you really don't know what you're getting out of that well. Same with you don't know what you're getting from the world. When you take whatever the world has to offer, you don't know what you're getting back because you, you just don't know. Because the world is full of just chaos. So you don't know what you're picking at. Um, so, um, but then I want to think about the um, Jesus as well. So we have Jacob's well. His well could have had blood in it, water, poison, mud. The, um, if you're, I want to put it to my point with the world having different things that they offer, it could have been bad for you. It could have cost you some things, some bad things, but think about the world that Jesus has. The outcome is always the same. The outcome is always life. It's always going to be life. And, um, the satisfaction that we get from Jacob's well might not be as good as the last one. So you see, I have love here. But then I have happiness here. But then I get one of these black cards that I pull from this, this pile. I got to put one down. Now I don't have it no more. So I got to pick something else up again. But it's still black. I got to put something else down too. So you never know what you're getting with pulling from what the world has to offer. But with the well that Jesus offers, offers it's always life. Y'all all right? Say y'all right in the comments. We'll make sure y'all good. And y'all sticking with me. All right, so um, the well that Jesus was describing was the word. The word of God is the mechanisms that quiet the activities of our flesh and, and soul and strengthens our, strengthens our spirit man. 
And that's coming from the book of Santa again. Y'all need to get the book. It's a good book. So now Jacob's well. Now can Jacob's well do that? I'm going to read it again. The well, the word of God is a mechanism that quiets the activities of our flesh and soul and strengthens our spirit, man. Can the world strengthen your spirit, man? Are you going to run to something that didn't even create you to get the strength? The world isn't the source of our strength. God is the source of our strength. So we have to realize that we don't get our strength from the world. It comes from God. Um, Jacob's well can only do one thing, and that is to, to quench someone's thirst. The world can only do one thing but to satisfy the flesh. That's all the world is satisfying is the flesh. Um, the word of God, on the other hand, offers more than what the world has to offer. The word is alive. The word gives life, y'all. It gives life. The word has answers and solutions to our situations. The word of God is the satisfaction we need. It's all that we need. So what does this satisfaction look like? So um, in Psalm 16 and 11, they'll show me the path of life and thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand and there are pleasures forevermore. It didn't say pleasures for a few weeks. It also didn't say fullness of joy for 30 minutes. It says forever, evermore, and, and evermore means forever. As long as you live for Jesus and follow him, he'll show you the path of life. He'll expose you to things that the world cannot expose you to. But the question is, are we going to submit to Jacob's well or are we going to submit to the well Jesus has? One well we can see. One well has all of the benefits that we can clearly see. You see this stack? These are all the benefits that Jacob's well comes with. The other well, we can't really see what the what the outcomes is from this well, but the outcomes are always consistent. You don't get consistency with the world. You'll get something new every single time, and then some of the stuff won't even be good. So are you willing to sacrifice your what you're familiar to for something that you can't see, but the outcomes are always pleasant and consistent? So that's a question that um, I would ask, like you would ask yourself every day. Am I willing to sacrifice something that I hold dear to my heart for Jesus? All right. So um, sacrifice is actually um, my next point. So um, I want to talk to y'all about the sacrificial part of worship. While we are called to worship, God is a God, God who lacks nothing. He literally doesn't lack anything. So why does he really demand it from us? When I um, when I first started to take this walk with God seriously, I'm like, why would God do all this stuff? It's so much like he wants so much from me. Like, what? Ugh. But um, the the answer I have to that is we we were created to worship. We were created to live the life as worshipers. Um, in Isaiah 43, 21, it reads the people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. So we were formed, we were created by him. He is our father. He is our creator. We ought to worship him because he deserves it because he created us. He created everything. So, um, but sometimes God's way doesn't really seem appetizing. So I'm going to be really, really be honest. It does not seem appetizing. He requires a lot of us. There's, there's things that he wants us to do that don't really make sense. We don't know why he wants us to do it, but we have to be obedient, right? Um, living a life of worship means we have to sacrifice our will for God's. It's hard because our will tailors to what our flesh really needs. Like if our flesh needs some money, our flesh is going to get that money by any means necessary. And the outcome of doing that can always come back to bite us in the butt. So when our flesh is satisfied, it's really hard to let go of what's really satisfying us. Because our, our will, our flesh is really easy to manage. We can get what we want. We can get it quick. But God's, but God's will will literally have you do the complete opposite of what your flesh wants you to do. It's really a hard decision. But it's, it's a decision that we need to make. And we need to make it now. Um, we all have to die daily. Um, walking with God isn't just dying one day. Now, it would be great if today I'm like, I'm down to my flesh. And that means I can really just have it all. But that's not it. I literally have to wake up every day and die to my flesh daily because my flesh does not want what God wants. 
because what God wants, we have to work to do it. We have to sacrifice to do it. But what our flesh wants, we can do it. We can get it quick. We can get it done quick. Um, in Romans um, 8, 12, and 14, um, it reads, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if, but if through the power of spirit of the spirit you put to death, sorry. But if through the power of spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Are, are children of God. Also, um, in Romans twelve and one in the King James version, it says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren." I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which your is which is your reasonable service. But I want to read this to you in the NIV version, just to really make my point of the whole entire message. Um, it reads, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I hear that. This is your true and proper worship. So this verse right here really gives you the answer of how to live the life of a worshiper. I can stop right now. Really. But um, it, it, it really sounds simple, but it's a tough thing to do. Um, I really think that sacrifice and submission, they go hand in hand because you can't submit to something without sacrificing something else. You can't accept this life. You can't accept this card without getting rid of all these cards. You can't have both. You have to choose. Um, so uh, during the worship intensive um, with Apostle Dwayne, he was teaching us about sacrificing our desires, our wills, our will and our idols. And that, y'all, that really messed me up. If y'all was in that class, y'all understand. It was all manifest manifesting in there. It was bad. Um, but it really messed me up because it, it had me reflect on my life. It made me realize that I have so many different walls up and it is blocking me from reaching Jesus. Same how, same is like you want, you want both of these cards, both stack of these cards, but Jesus is at the bottom because this is in a way. He can't get to you when all this is in a way. You have to get rid of this for him to get here. You understand? Um, so yeah, it was like, it was things that I was thinking about, like, yo, this is really in God's way. I have to get rid of this, but I like it so bad. So that really was, that really had me messed up for a few days. Um, we hold our idols so close to our hearts. Um, Jesus is supposed to be the only one that our heart really desires. It's not true worship. If there's more than one God who has your heart. Worship involves the aligning of our hearts to God and his will. So if we're not willing to give up some things we know that's not of God, we'll never tap into the true worship that we were created for. Um, when I was preparing this, I was like writing it as I was going to talk to like a, a new believer from the street, off the street or something. And um, I thought of one of the questions that they might have asked me, like, what are the outcomes? What's in it for me? You got me getting rid of all this stuff for this man I have not seen a day in my life. And that is a really valid question. Because I'm telling them like, yo, give this up and take this instead because it'll be good for you. But they don't know the outcomes of, they don't know the outcome of it. Like what's in it for me? So um, I'm getting ready to tell this person, this, this new believer, what are the outcomes? Um, when, we work, when we live a life as, um, as worshipers, something amazing happens. It sets us free. Just like Paul and Silas in the prison, their worship shook the very foundation of the prison. So I'm just going to like read, uh, give you a quick summary of um, Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, um, the story of them, it reads, When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their, their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was, a such, there, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. All the chains fell out. They were free. Um, but you see what I just read. You didn't see that they prayed and sang hymns because they were in prison. They lived the life of worship. So they were only doing what they what they knew how to. And that was that was worship. So God set them free. Um, I want you all to 
type in the chat. There's freedom when we live life as worshipers because there really is. Now, I don't know about y'all, but um, reading the story of Paul and Silas, um, I love that without them having to ask God to set, set them free, he did it anyway. He helped them anyway. Um, Paul and Silas found themselves in a bad situation. They were in shackles, locked up, sentenced to die. Their first response wasn't, wasn't to beg for freedom or ask God to release them. They did the only thing that they knew how, and that was to worship. And also an, another thing that stood out to me that I really loved about this story was that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. So when I think of the foundation, I think of the what's holding the prison up. So like if you're building a building, you build the foundation first and then the actual building on top. If that foundation is shaky, that thing is coming down quick. So um, what I really loved is that um, he they, they worship so bad. Like there's probably inner dancing, everything like dancing bad. Click track was on 190. Is that, is that the fastest the click track go to? I don't know. But they were dancing bad, I believe, and shaking the very foundation of the prison. So um, how many of y'all believe that God can shake the foundation of what's troubling you? He will deal with what's troubling you, but he will also deal with the root, which is the foundation. So the ability for it to come back and destroy you is now destroyed. So you don't have to worry about it no more. Isn't that amazing? You don't have to do too much. Just live your life. For God and his will and he'll handle the rest. Um, having a heart of worship is not something we do because it's fun, though. I mean, we can have fun while we while we live this life as worshipers, but there's no life without it. Um, there is a level of peace and sustainability that you get when you worship in um, in Philippines, chapter four, verse seven. Uh, it reads, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So there's supernatural peace that comes to that comes to you when you cry out to the Savior and you live your life as a, as worshipers. And don't think for a second that he does not hear you. He does not hear your cry or he doesn't see how good that you're living your life because he does. He sees you. He hears you. Um, in Psalms 116 verse 1, it says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The, the cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the, on the name of the Lord and he saved me. You call on the name of the Lord and he, he's there for you. When troubles come, I challenge you all to allow worship to be your first response. Um, so one of the third uh, aspects of worship um, is service. Um, we see it all the time. We see singing, intercession, dancing, instruments, studying the word, poetry, painting. Those are all services of worship. Um, we see this every second and fourth Friday and Sunday when we meet here at DGC. But it's not limited only in the church, though. We can do it anywhere. Um, I challenge you all to use this as a weapon against the chaos of, world, uh, of the world. One of the things that helped me when I was going through was the word of God, the bread of life. Uh, the word of God has he has answers for everything. The word isn't dead. It's alive. So that's why we're able to find insight in the word. It's not only just for history, but it's for future as well. It's the same God yesterday, today and forevermore. It's the same word yesterday, today and forevermore. It's never going to change, but it's always going to be alive and it's always going to be present and whatever you need for it. Um, so what I was used to do is find stories and scriptures that deal with the certain things that I was going through. So I, I have like a, I have a few that I wrote down for y'all. So just take your notes and do what I need to do with that. So um, if you're lost, read Isaiah four and 10. If you're confused, read Matthew seven and seven broken hearted Psalm seven, seventy three, twenty six. You don't know what your purpose is. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. These are all promises of, uh, of God that he has in his word that is there to remind you that you are not alone. That's one of the outcomes of you living life as worship and using um, the word as to fight your, um, fight your battles. It, it literally fights the lies of the enemy because all the enemy does is lie. And when you feed your issues with the promises of God, those lies, they get thrown out the window because they don't matter. 
because it's lies. All the devil does is tell lies. So when, when anxiety comes in to attack your mind, you fight it with worship and watch the peace that surpasses all understanding come to meet you. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is that you don't have to go far to get it. You don't have to travel. You don't have to, to Google. It's right there. You do have to Google some of the verses. But he meets you where you are. You don't have to go and, and look anywhere else for it. The world, won't, the world does not offer it to you. Only God will. Um, last thing I think I believe is worship builds intimacy. That's another outcome of you living this life as, as, as a worshiper. So what is intimacy? In intimacy refers to a close and private connection or bond between individuals, often involving emotional, physical, or psychological closeness. It can encompass various aspects of relationships, such as trust, vulnerability, vulnerability, affection, and deep personal sharing. So part of our call as believers in Christ Jesus is having a greater level of intimacy. Um, the father, he really wants to be with you. He wants to walk with you all day. He wants to visit you during your time of intimacy. That's he loves that. That's what he wants. So how do you really build intimacy, though? Um, one of the aspects I stated earlier is submission. Submit your heart to him in a romantic relationship. You literally hand your significant other your heart because you trust them with it. That's why it's so easy for you to be intimate because you trust them with your heart. Submission to God is a hard thing to do because it's always, it always doesn't feel good at the time. We have to give up a few things to fully submit. But in that submission, you gain Jesus. Because you die to your flesh and you give up what you held dear to your heart, that's when Jesus comes to meet you. Intimacy is built with your connection to the Father through your life of worship. And building intimacy is not just good for your soul, but you get to know who God is for real. He really, he like, he exposes himself, he exposes himself to you differently than, than you knew before. Intimacy is built when we removed all idols from our lives and replaced them with God and his word. Because idols, they limit the ability for intimacy to grow between you and God. So think about that. Those things that you, you held dear to your heart, things that you held dear to your heart, and this is God, you put them over it, he, he, can't, get, he, he can't get to you because this is right here in your heart. He can't get to your heart like that. You have to remove these, and then he gets to your heart. Amen? Having um, intimacy with God, it really reveals another part of him that you couldn't tap into because your heart wasn't ready to submit for it. You know him, you'll know him in a deeper way. There's so many different mysteries that have yet been revealed to you. Um, he wants to take you deeper and deeper into him once you submit your heart. I understand, it, um, I understand not wanting to, to submit because submitting is, ha is literally giving up control of what you of is give is giving up control over what you already have. So we want to be in control of our lives. We want to be in control of where we go, our will, what we do, how we think, how we act. But now we have to give that up and we have to, to submit to someone else and allow him to guide you and to tell you what to do and tell you where to go. So you're literally trusting him to do it. It's hard because like I said, you have sometimes you have to do the complete opposite of what you want to do. So, and reflecting on the encounter of the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, we uncover profound truths about our pursuits and desires. Like the Samaritan woman, we often seek fulfillment in the wells of the world, temporarily temporary sources that promise satisfaction, but ultimately it leaves us wanting more. However, Jesus presents us with a different kind of well, the one that offers eternal life and satisfaction. This well represents the essence of true worship and intimacy with God. Through sacrifice, submission, we tap into the transformative power of worship, experiencing freedom, peace, and a deeper, deeper connection with our creator. So as we, as we journey in worship, we discover the profound joy of knowing who God is. We dive into the deeper depths of his love and purpose for our lives. So let us embrace worship as not merely a obligation, but a pathway to profound fulfillment and intimacy with the king. 
So, again, we have this blue stack of cards. Each card holds a different value, but you have to lose a few. So you go running back to the same deck to get some more. And all you find yourself is you're in this cycle that never ends because you're always empty and you're never satisfied. But this one red card has the answers to everything. All you need is to throw these blue cards away and watch what the red card really holds. Watch how much value the red card really holds when you finally when it when it finally has to stop competing with the other blue cards. So, that's all I got for y'all. I hope y'all was blessed. <laughs> um, y'all got any questions or any um, comments? I'm looking at the comments now so I can see what y'all saying. Hey, everyone. Hey, Essence. Pastor Shaw, I love you. Lacey, I love you. All right. So, I just want to um, give y'all an opportunity to give. Um, the giving options might be on the screen. Um, but I don't want to mess this up, but cash app is destiny global church and it's, it's going to be on the screen. Cause I don't know the rest because <laughs> I just give cash app. Amen. I need to just do cash app. Y'all it's easy, but, um, that's all I have. Uh, we'll see y'all tomorrow. Um, we do have destiny encounter, um, at seven 30 tomorrow. Um, join us online, join us in person. I'm leading worship. Yeah. So come, you know, come out and hang out with me, come worship with me. But it was a joy talking to y'all. I really loved, loved to explain what was in my head. I had a lot on my head, so I'm glad to get it out. But um, y'all have a great rest of y'all week. I love y'all, and we'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.